Chris Fowler knows his football. Segway. Chris just called the uh, game between Washington and Oregon State. Rivalry week. He's calling Florida State and Florida 7 Eastern on the mothership. Also, 30 years of college game day on the road. Chris joining us now. What was it like 30 years ago? Do I get five guesses for everything you're asking? <laughs> you, I just want to make sure we, you, we had the if, if you want to. <laughs> what was the first road trip? 1993, uh, number one versus number two at Notre Dame, Florida State, uh, Bowden versus Holtz. Uh, it was an epic kind of regular season game we had been waiting for. We had been lobbying to get the show on the road for a while in the regular season. Nobody really wanted to spend the money. That matchup kind of justified it, and uh, it, it was it was pretty cool. We, we didn't know what we were doing out there in South Bend, but we, we stumbled on it, and we got through it, and it was the birth. But what – when did you know it was something it, more than just, hey, we're taking Sports Center on the road or, you know, NFL prime time? When did it become we, like, uh oh? We had done it in bowl games, but that wasn't the same thing as doing it on a campus. Yeah. So once we felt the energy, the pep rally at Notre Dame Friday night is pretty wild. Uh, you know, Corso said he wanted to change his pick after watching the energy at Notre Dame's <laughs> campus on Friday night, but ended up going with the alma mater uh, incorrectly in that case. But no, we, Dan, is it, in 94, 95, we took it on the road uh, more regularly, and these crowds began to build. Because that first day, it's in the lobby of the Hall of Fame. People had wandered in Saturday to, let's check out some trophies. Where's the rock need to split? What's, what the <laughs> hell's going on over here? Is this a TV show? They really stumbled in, like, not knowing what they were seeing. Uh, game they didn't have a very high profile back then. And, but still, you could tell once the game was over, and they all spilled back in there to celebrate Holtz storms out of his office and up on the set and just arrives unannounced and sits down and takes a victory lap. I mean, we knew at that point that to, to, to be there on a campus for these big games uh, was going to be something. We also knew we had a lot to learn how to stage it. All right, let me uh, dive into college football this weekend. Actually, let's fast forward to tomorrow night. How does the committee look at Florida State now with, you know, Florida State losing their quarterback? Uh, how do you – how do you kind of process the resume and then forecast what you think they're going to be? They're supposed to ignore what they think Florida State's going to be with, with Tate Rodemaker and others uh, trying to fill in for Travis because you can't really replace him. Mm. So they're going to look at the resume. The resume is good. I do think Florida State fans have a right to be a little bit concerned. Um, number one, because they don't have these big wins down the stretch. Yeah, okay, it's a rivalry game in Gainesville. I'm going to call that game on Saturday. But the Gators have have staggered, and, and, and they're, they're just playing to get to 6-6. Six and six. And then Louisville, a good team. The committee seems to like them, but they haven't really played a heavyweight schedule themselves. And then is beating Louisville in the ACC championship game, if it's close, is that going to get them over the hump if they're competing against other teams with, with great resumes? You'd like to think they would not downgrade the current team based on not having their quarterback. Uh, they say they don't, but we'll see. I go back to what was it, 2014 with Ohio State, JT Barrett, and then Cardale Jones came in and you know kept them in the playoffs, uh, kept them relevant. I don't know if that'll be the situation here with Florida. That's what you point to. That's yeah. what you point to if you're Mike Norvell. That's the best possible example. And he remember Cardale Jones was third string at the beginning of the season because it was supposed to be Braxton Miller's team, and he got hurt, and, and Barrett takes over. And, and that's the best example. Now, I don't know if, if Tate Rodemaker is Cardale Jones, but I do know that the Knowles have some great pieces around him. I mean, it, Jamel, Jamel Holloway, remember he came in and, and as a freshman replaced Troy Aikman? and took him to the national championship running a totally different offense. They yeah. redid the offense for him. And in the NFL, you know, there's been many examples of backups coming in and doing great things and Brady on down the line. It's a different thing than college, but you know, I, I think they've got enough to get through the next two games. And if they get in the bracket, you know, I, they, they'd have their hands full, but uh, if Travis was a special player, I feel awful. He wasn't one of these guys that transferred in, Dan, and was there for like eight months. Five years yeah. at Florida State. Five yeah. years through some really, really tough times. And uh, that was a tough one for those of us that love the sport and know him to watch him cart it off like that. How interesting is Michigan uh, now what's happened? Are, are they interesting off the field any longer? When Harbaugh got there, they've been interesting, man. It was always interesting to cover Michigan because it, it was such a – unusual experience he was just so quirky all the time that you, you never sort of 
knew what you're going to get. But um, I mean, yeah, of course, it's super compelling. I mean, the fact that they have pulverized Ohio State the last couple of years, um, completely manhandled them after halftime. I know they're going into that game thinking the blueprint works. Right. We, we beat him in a submission a couple of years ago and last year, 28 um, three after halftime. They, they think they're the tougher, more physical team. And, you know, that gets Ryan Day all fired up and that's <laughs> there's plenty of motivation on their side. But, hey, that's where that came from. That's where the thing came from. that Ohio State wasn't tough enough at the line of scrimmage to beat these big teams was the, the Michigan games the last couple of years. So they've, they've got the opportunity to to flip the script, but it won't be easy. What about off the field? Yeah, I mean, listen, you people act like Harbaugh is be, sitting out because they have to punish the program, or at least the Big Ten felt like they had to answer to the 13 other teams and levy some punishment. Um, and they've been making do without him. But l- listen, I, you know, the sign stealing thing is fascinating. I've had conversations with coaches the last few weeks about is it how big a thing is it? If you're an offensive coach, they think it's a huge thing. I mean, Lincoln Riley says there were double digit points on Saturday if they have your signals. Other defensive coaches say, well, it depends on how much time you have to react. Is it really that big an edge? I mean, there's a difference of opinion among coaches, but what they're united on is if you're going to record it, if you're going to take it to that degree, then you've gone way too far. And and when you break the rules consistently, um, systematically, and effectively, you're going to get punished more than somebody else. You can't say, hey, well, what about them? No, no, you did it way differently than they did, allegedly. Talking to Chris Fowler, ABC Saturday Night Football, uh, Washington and Oregon State this uh, past weekend. He's got Florida State, Florida coming up this week on the mothership. Uh, better team, not better resume, better team, Washington, Oregon. Oregon. I mean, I, UW fans are going to hate me saying that. I, I called the game in Seattle, um, but I think that Oregon has been has been consistently dominant. I mean, it's very close to me. I mean, I, I think that Washington is still really hard to beat because – they got a bunch of dudes who are going to be playing on Sunday who, who who pitch it and catch it. And and they know how to come up with big plays when they need it. But but I think Oregon would be favored in the rematch. And I hope we get to see it. I would love to be there in Vegas for that one uh, with a playoff bid on the line. I mean, it's a hatred game anyway. Uh, but I think they'd be favored probably close to a touchdown. And they're that impressive, I think, since the loss. Where do you stand on uh, the Heisman race? I mean, I mean, I, I don't like to talk about it because you got to be the one standing there to interview the winner. <laughs> never, I never, you're not going to get my ballot out of me. You're and you never that. open the envelope, right? You never know what's no, in. No, no, no. <laughs> They've got someone from the Heisman Trust. I, I, I know in the commercial break before, and I don't want to know before that. Okay, it's dumb to sit there and like look at the finalists and I, you know, make eye contact. <laughs> you don't want to know until the last second, but I, I do want to know in the commercial break before in case the, the result goes some totally unexpected direction. And I'm standing there having to think of questions, but you know, I, I think that it's interesting. I mean, you know, Nix has some very, very interesting stats and in Oregon has obviously been a powerhouse team. I don't know how you can be more impressive as a quarterback than what Jaden Daniels has done at LSU. I don't know how you can play better than that. Yeah. I mean, as a thrower and a runner, they've got three losses. They're not going to be playing on championship Saturday. Um, he's got to light up Texas A&M. you got to take up every chance you get. But, I mean, to me, he's had an amazing season that's been overlooked because or, uh, LSU just hasn't been a playoff team. Yeah, I, I think Penix's story is, is pretty remarkable with what he's done with Washington as well. And Bo Nix with, you know, transferring from Auburn and what he's done as well. Yeah, I'm kind of torn here. I mean, I, Marvin Harrison Jr. might be the best player, but – I don't think, you know, he's going to win the high, unless he did something incredible against Michigan. Well, he's got to do that. He, he was the best player on the field, and it made a difference in Ohio State's biggest game. Well, now this is a much bigger game. Can he be the best player on the field and make a difference? You know, he had three catches last week. They didn't need him. Against, and against a lot of opponents, if he weren't there, the result is totally the same. Not mm-hmm. to discount what he's done. He's been brilliant. I think Roma Dunze of Washington, what Penix's major target is, is a surefire NFL star. He's had a great season too. Fun. Brock Bowers might be the best player in the country at any position if he's healthy all year. But again, he's a tight end. And this is a quarterback sport. And I spend 
50% of my time when I analyze a team every week, looking at the quarterback analytics and every situational thing you can think of, because that's really what decides games, right? How is the QB on third down? How is he in the red zone? It's come from Sunday down to Saturday. And you just have to acknowledge that the sport is largely based on their performance. So why wouldn't the Heisman go to the guy at that position? 12-team playoff next year, any downside? Um, I think there's unintended consequences and people who think that this is a chance for all those who've been overlooked and ignored to get in. You get, you got an 18 team big 10, you got an expanded sec with OU in Texas. Where do you think the majority of those playoff bids are going to go? I mean, they're going to go to sec three and four big 10, three and four. It's going to fill the bracket up and people are going to realize that no matter what you do, you're probably still going to have the same heavyweight program standing at the end. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of games down the stretch, but instead of determining whether they're in the bracket, it's going to be about seeding and home field. That's what the NFL is, right? So if you, if you like that model, you'll like the college model. If, if you think that college should be distinct from the NFL, um, you're going to be appalled at some of the changes because regular season games flat out just won't mean as much. They it, it just won't. You, you know, you, you think Alabama's ever going to miss the playoff? <laughs> you think Georgia's not going to be there? Yeah. The Ohio State, Michigan, that they're going to all be in there every single year. So, uh, should Lincoln Riley be on the hot seat? No, no. But I think they need. There needs to be some soul searching either by him or or um, the staff. I mean, they, they, you have to. You have to become obsessed with defense if you're him. You've got to simply address the fact that defenses have not been good enough. And it, it, it's it's tough when you, you people see a guy like Caleb Williams come to USC and he's going to leave without winning a conference championship. You know, it's like Drake May, probably the best quarterback Carolina's ever had, not going to win an ACC championship while he's there. And, and you just hate to waste a generational type talent because the team isn't complete enough. So you need to make the team more complete. You need to you need to get much much better in the trenches. But I don't I don't put him on the hot seat. I mean they've got uh, they've tried through NIL to get better in the trenches. They didn't ignore it, but they just got a lot of work to do. Before I let you go, since we're celebrating 30 years of College Game Day, whose idea was it for Coach Corso to put on the headgear? His. I mean, it, it started out with kind of a. Oh, a, a baseball hat or something lame, and then it was a helmet, and then then the Ohio State. Game uh, where he famously saw Brutus Buckeye's head, asked for it. They politely said no, uh, and then they negotiated it because because Kirk Herbstreit's wife Allison was was part of the cheerleading team. That's a, that's a true story. And, and they finally <laughs> convinced them. And the minute he put it on, you talk about a light bulb moment. We didn't know with the first road show, but you knew with the first headgear pick. Oh, like this is a thing. And and you know, this many decades later, it is part of pop culture. But that that was the first one. And and uh, I mean. Look, Dan, it's tough. I mean, Lee Corso, before he went through his struggles with the stroke, was, you know this, what was a, a dynamic electric performer. I mean, he was nobody like him, and there never will be anybody like him again. He was so quick and, and so instinctively funny and, and razor sharp in, in, in that kind of show business way. And he thought of it. Lightning struck that day, and and, and the rest is history. But I, I, I'm sad that there's generations of viewers that have seen, you know, Lee courageously struggle with his situation. I, I, it, it's deeply moving to me. It's powerful what he's had to battle through. But I, I hope people also go to YouTube and understand that, you know, that for a couple decades, that's why game day in large part got to where it was because of, uh, you know, his, his ability to sort of create and spark and be an entertainer. Well put. My best to the family. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, safe, yeah. safe travels there, buddy. The whole crew there. We'll do it again. Thank you, bud. That's uh, Chris Fowler, College Game Day.